guys, Rick Shaw here again. It's the 16th of May on a beautiful day. And uh, just want to talk about some of the things I missed uh, in the States. I was uh, loved to hunt. I used to love to hunt. I, I fox hunted with the Walker Fox Hounds, uh, coon hunted, rabbit hunted, squirrel hunted, turkey hunted one time. Uh, Deer hunted, oh my goodness, yeah, like crazy. Bear hunted, uh, with clothes on. <laughs> but uh, love, I always loved to hunt with the dogs, though. Uh, one of my favorite things to do, uh, even at nighttime, was get out with a good pair. Of, I had a good pair of Walker Foxhounds, and uh, we turned them loose, and they'd get on a trail. Uh, I had a lot of my friends wanted to get into it and bought dogs. We trained them, and... Uh, and got them into dogs, and they say, "I've been uh, hunting these these uh, foxes, and I've never seen a fox yet. These dogs are no good. They're chasing something else." Well, you got to take them guys out with you because uh, what they don't understand is when uh, uh, when a foxhound is chasing a fox, that fox ain't right in front of them dogs running full tilt. He's trotting along at his own leisure, uh, a quarter mile ahead of him <laughs> or more. You know, so you just have to know where they cross, because they all they cross in the same spot, and uh, that's when you get them. Now, I was a, I was a gunsmith. I had different uh, firearms. My my first gun I had was a uh, Savage Fox, 222 with a 20 gauge on the bottom break top. That was that was a really nice gun. I used that for fox hunting. And then when I got into gunsmithing, I got a EA Brown falling block action. I put a, a short barrel, and you can put a 16-inch barrel on your rifle. That's that's uh, legal as long as it meets the overall length. I, I custom built a little stock for it, and I did it in 22K Hornet. And I had an aperture peep sight. I didn't need, and I could I could hit stuff. Uh, I could hit stuff out to, you know, 200 yards or so, and that's just, that's about as far as you need it. And uh, I used to use full metal jackets on that uh, 22, and. Uh, it, that K-Horn has got some pretty good speed out of that barrel. I had a Shylin Select Match barrel stainless, and uh, that thing really cooked along very well. Fantastic little action, super light gun. Uh, you know, I always, I always went for the super light guns. Uh, people say, oh well, you know, if you get a one, it'll kick you like a mule and all that stuff. Well, I, I always think of it this way: uh, shooting is like the smallest percentage of the time you're going to be doing with a rifle. The rest of the time, you're going to carry it. Uh, I had a uh, uh, doctor friend that I built a rifle for, and I actually laminated uh, strips of balsa wood together, uh, made it in a 243 on a, on a Mini Mark 10 action for him to make it super light. And I mean, I, I skeletonized the barrel, the action. I did everything I could to make that rifle light for him. And, uh, you know, because just didn't want to carry it. Very, very uh, thin uh, Indian guy, uh, lightweight. Uh, small as as men go but a super great guy and, and I built him a nice rifle he could hunt deer with if he wanted to but uh, I love to hunt I miss I miss all the dogs uh, you know I just did a video on the dogs here uh, don't anybody think I'm a dog hater uh, I'm not uh, love them uh, always had them this has been a long break it's like with the motorcycle this has been the longest break I've been in my entire life without a dog or a motorbike even when I was uh, here before in the Philippines, had a dog. You know, I had a dog to cruise around with me. Uh, that's just that's just the way it went. Uh, I had a fantastic dog too, very well trained, very too small. Uh, she was a very small uh, uh, shepherd, German shepherd. Uh, she was like to run to the litter, and they couldn't sell her. Uh, and actually, uh, these people were gonna were gonna kill it. They bred it. And I went over and looked at her, and, and uh, roof of her mouth was jet black, and she had the most beautiful color and just a happiest little pup. And I said, "Hey, I'll take her." And uh, that was absolutely out of all the dogs I ever owned. If I could have one dog back, it would be that dog because she was just she did hand signals. She she looked at your face uh, when it, when I used to train dogs. There's two kinds of dogs that I saw. There's dogs that think your brain is in your hand and they watch your hands, and then there's dogs that look at your face. She could do both. She looked at both. She was just so bright and intelligent, that dog. And I uh, trained her up so fast, it was unbelievable. I could take her to the middle of an in intersection, up around Longapo, and tell her to sit and stay and go around the corner. And, you know, and she wouldn't budge until she heard me whistle. 
you know, she she just was that smart, and that's that's a scary thing for a dog. But everybody said, man, I can't believe you, that dog. You know what a wonderful dog. But they're they're all trained up. I used to train uh, uh, foxhounds, coonhounds, uh, had squirrel dogs. Uh, you know, just loved it. And I do miss I do miss the hunting. Uh, I miss it uh, terribly. Uh, you know, that was a, that was a big thing I really loved to do when I was in the states. Every chance I every chance I got. And coon hunting was coon hunting was always uh, a blast, you know. Uh, I actually uh, and fox hunting that was my favorite. One time, uh, fox foxes though, it don't take much to to kill a fox. Uh, you know, I had a I had a buddy. He used to just carry the uh, 22 shorts. He says you don't you you just break the skin and they'll die. And and what happened to me when I first started hunting, my buddy Bob that got me into the the hunting of foxes. I had an old 20 gauge. Uh, um, can't remember the I can't remember the brand H and R I think it was it was it was a clunker I got it, I got it for like fifteen bucks off a of buddy and uh, the ejector was broke uh, and that was before I was a gunsmith and it was it, it had been sawed off so there was no <laughs> no choke to it so the guy could shoot pumpkin balls for deer or something and I got the thing real cheap and it was beat up and all that stuff but but you fired one shot. And then you had to dig the dig the uh, shell out because the ejector was broke. So, so I saw a fox way down the hill, and I didn't realize that the 20 gauge doesn't reach that far. And this thing was about 80 years off, and I took a, I took a whack at him, and uh, it, he just looked at me and just kept kept trotting to where he was going. And uh, my buddy hollered at me, he's going he's going for the gas road. So I'm up on top of this ridge, and I'm running I'm running there with with my. Uh, jackknife <laughs> trying to peel this, this shell out and uh, heading towards the gas line I'm trying to look at him every now and again and sure enough he's on a he's on a path below us running towards running towards the gas line and I got out to the gas line the shell popped out I got a new one in and as soon as I looked up there he was and he was surprised as I would and I slammed that gun shut with my finger on the trigger and I shot right in front of me you, things you just shouldn't do you know <laughs> just the dumbest stuff you could ever do and that fox dropped over dead and I and I couldn't believe it and I, I looked at him he was dead his tongue was hanging he was he was a goner so I uh, picked him up put him in the sack and, and we skinned him and you know something not a single BB hole in him had a heart attack I guess uh, the shot scared them so they, they're very uh, skittish and scary but uh, there's something to hunt and when they're running the gray fox and the red fox when they're running seems like the red fox like to run the fields and the gray like to stay in the woods uh, love to hunt them rabbit hunting was another one uh, I used to hunt the rabbits with the 410 contender pistol but my contender pistol the, the it scattered in a terrible pattern I never could do well with it so I put it on the lathe and I uh, it had the the way it had the choke uh, the shot would go out the barrel and spin because of the rifling for the 45 Colt and then there would be these veins that would stop the shot well that deformed the shell and it, it there was just no distance to it you had to be right up on a rabbit to get a pellet in it and I thought this this is no good so uh, and it's you're you're actually not supposed to do it but uh, I went ahead and put it on the lathe made myself a nice long bit and I reamed out I basically overboard it I cut all the rifling out and then I smoothed it up uh, with sandpaper and then I took that choke out and I built a, a new choke a full choke on it and then that thing started patterning we started uh, I had a buddy we used to go over to his house and he had a, this big retarded boy and he would roll this uh, tire down the side of a hill and when we get to the bottom of the hill there was some ruts and stuff so the tire would bounce and we had styrofoam inside this uh, these tires and that boy would run that thing run these tires up and down the hill all day and it got to the point when I started shooting that 410 uh, in the evenings you could see the shot you could see that that shot and it, it actually looks like it curves when you're looking at it but I found out you really I had to lead that tire even though I would only be uh, 15 yards you, with that little 410 you had to lead the heck out of a rabbit and once I learned that uh, then it then it got really good I started hitting them on a regular basis uh, I also had that contender because I had it a 22 with a scope and that was my squirrel hunting weapon that thing was fantastic I used to have a little dog and I na his name was Jack when I got him and I named him on the thing Jack Hoff because he, he was a little bastard he was he was a uh, they called him a rat terrier 
because he was a mixture of some terriers and he looked like he had cancer because a lot of his hair was gone uh, but he was really something he would he was so light sometimes when he would stand there his back legs would come off the ground when he was looking for squirrel and he didn't smell him or anything like that he would pitter patter over even dry leaves you could hardly hear him and he would pitter patter over the leaves and he'd look for him and when he'd see one he would bark at it and of course it would run to the other side of the tree and then i would get up to him and he'd, he'd be pointing where it was at and i'd say get him and he would run to the other side of the tree and as soon as that squirrel seen him he would come to my side and i'd pop him in the head uh, i i had the most joy with that uh with that dog in all my life uh, that was just the most fun dog, and we love we love squirrel. I mean, I I just eat the heck out of it. Used to make squirrel gravy, uh, eat that three four times a week during the season. Uh, just loved it, loved that stuff like you wouldn't believe. But I gave that uh, that dog to my one of my best buddy's son. He he really wanted that dog, and uh, I didn't really want to get rid of him, but. Uh, that dog went to the fantastic home because that boy was hunting him every day and uh took, took him even took him in the house you know it was like his house dog and stuff so bathed him up all the time and and uh, had him had him for many years uh and and i every time i went over there it would it would just come to me it wouldn't even listen to the boy no more and hunt for me so i, I had a blast with that but love to hunt and play with the firearms uh here you're just you don't get to do it uh through, through the U.S., I always carried a firearm uh, pretty much wherever I went. Even in some of the places where you weren't allowed to, I just kept low profile and kept it anyway. Uh, I was actually walking through town. My car broke down, and uh, I was stopped, like, in the center of a town, but I was in, in a spot to park. And a fella told me uh, there was no cell phones or anything back in that day, and... and uh, he said if you walk down the road here there's a service station they will come they will come and uh and fix you up and i said i said okay and it was something i couldn't fix i had tools and all that and i had a long three-quarter inch duster and in a you know like a fedora type hat and i'm walking down the road and i and i had it was illegal to carry in or anything but i had a uh, uh a little 357 uh snubby smith stuck down stuck down the front of me and uh, I'm walking down the street, and of course these cops didn't see me in this little small town, and they were like, "Hey, who are you? What do you, you know? Who are you?" Uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just walking down. My car's broke. I'm trying. I'm going down the gas station. Get up against the car. You know, they were, they were very, very rude. Uh, definitely violated my rights and all that, but frisked me. They frisked the heck out of me. Put me, put me in cuffs. In the, they actually put them in the front because I was being totally cool with these guys. They put me in the back of the car where they were running me. And uh, those dummies didn't realize I could have popped them both in the back of the head if I would have been a, a rotten bastard. But, uh, you know, it's just how so dumb some cops are. But uh, they wound up letting, uh, letting me out. They didn't even give me a ride. <laughs> they didn't even give me a ride to, to where I was going. And then when I got back, the meter had run out on my car because they held me up for like 20, 25 minutes. And, uh, and I had a ticket. <laughs> Not only did I have to pay, I had to have a, had to have a ticket. A ticket so it was it was really uh i actually uh, went to the police station and said how about you pay this ticket because these guys detained me you know and they they just laughed in my face but i tried it anyway but i do miss the hunting and the firearm shooting uh i used to take my kids out and we'd blast off five hundred thousand rounds on a weekend shooting at softballs and stuff uh my brother came out one time and uh we were firing firing all the guns actually i had a i had a uh, body armor and he had body armor we we would try it out i didn't trust that stuff you know let's let's see if it works first you know and, and the stuff works but uh one of the things i really loved to do i had a i had a um a 357 um uh, nice one it was a, it was a single shot barrel that i had on my contender and they you can't go low on a lot of powders you you have you can't go too high or you'll blow your gun up and you can't go too low otherwise it changes its state from a propellant to an explosive and it'll blow your gun up if you go too low except the powder called unique what i was using back then and what was really funny i would uh <laughs> when my brother would come to shoot i i would load up uh bullets in there high-powered bullets with 357 and shoot stuff and then i'd give it to him and i'd and i'd hand him a bullet over and it'd be uh one of the loads where i had it down to about 200 feet a second you could actually see the bullet flying <laughs> it would just make this big arc you go man what the heck and then another one i did was when i had the um 
the contender 45 and we'd be we'd be shooting we, we were shooting at skeet I would put the uh, I would put a shot shell in there without him looking and he'd be hand throwing a skeet for me and I'd shoot it with the with the 410 with the shotgun with the with the shotgun shell <laughs> just to open choke but I I just real quickly nail him and bust him and then every, when he'd load it up I'd hand him a pocket full of uh, 45 Colt and <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd go ahead and start throwing the skeet for him, and he never hit a damn one. And he thought he told everybody, "Oh, he's really good." He's <laughs> and I never told him. Uh, he doesn't watch my videos, so I don't think he's going to find out. He'd probably be torqued as hell if he. <laughs> but uh, I, we, that was our big. That used to be a big family thing. It was a family thing. Uh, I see a lot of these things on here that you know these people who believe in God and guns are all a bunch of nutbags. I'm seeing people say that. Well, you know something. That's what the United States country was built on don't ever give up your gun rights guys don't don't ever do that because you'll go the way of all the other countries that did it uh, look in the history of all the countries that the guns were taken away uh, it was a genocide soon to follow uh, and that's the history so you know just be wary of that but uh, I do miss the hunting uh, I love to love to uh, deer hunt that was one of my one of my favorite things uh, one of my stories I have about deer hunting that was just uh, just amazed me I had a buddy named Big Jack and he had diabetes really bad. I used to hunt with my buddy Richie and uh, and my buddy Big Jack. We'd stay up at the camp and hunt deer and uh, uh, Big Jack had a boy that would he liked to tromp through the woods and uh, he'd chase the deer out for his dad because his dad uh, was missing half of one foot. The other one was gone from the diabetes. Back the battery took a took a crap. These little wasabi batteries. Uh, that's as long as they last. That was a fully charged battery. The video I did earlier and this one and it was out. But but my buddy Big Jack he'd he'd sit on the back of his truck and uh, good way off. I'm I'm talking. We we I had a rangefinder. And uh, what I did was I, I took the range finder and at this uh, one point where the trees were was uh, 200 yards. And uh, then when you got to the top of the hill uh, where, the, where the tree line started, uh, that was right on 300. It was a 100 yard long field. And then the upper field, uh, as soon as you got over that woods to the, the upper field, that was 450 yards. That was a long way, super long way. And uh, so we're hunting and these deer come out and uh, they, they broke the lower field. They were, they were a little over 200 yards away. And it, it, where we hunted, you know, it was everybody wanted to hit him in the hit him in the head, hit him in the head. Well, Jack jumps off the back of the truck onto his stumps, basically. And he's wobbling like, and I'm looking at him and I wanted him to get the first shot because these things were in, in the field and they were going, going to cross the field. So there's plenty of time to shoot at him because it was a, a pretty good distance. And even though he was wobbling, he was one of these guys, I don't ever shoot till I see brown. And uh, he picked the biggest doe, it was doe season, he picked the biggest doe out, nailed her right in the head. He had a uh, pump, 7600, 30-06, uh, standing on his stumps, wobbling like crazy, and he waited till he saw brown. He hit that dang, he hit that deer that was on a dead run, at 200 yards, right in the head. And I, I asked him, that thing went right down, and uh, we went to go get, I used to always go with him to help him get his deer out of the woods and stuff, and uh, drugged the thing back, and it, it was hit right, you know, right below, behind the eye, below the ear, perfect shot. And I said, uh, where were you aiming on him? And he said, I, I had it just a, a couple inches in front of the nose when I squeezed. And he was one, one heck of a shot. I, I saw him another time. Uh, this was a couple years earlier. They shoot. They shoot dogs uh, in 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 the place where we were hunting. If there's a dog chasing deer, uh, they shoot them. And I did, back in those days, I didn't have a range finder or anything. But what we did, I had a buddy that had. Uh, he was an older fella, long long since passed when we were doing this. But he had one of those military range finders, and I hunted the certain areas, and he let me borrow it, and I would measure and set jugs out in fields, plastic jugs, and everybody knew they were there. Not many people went in a lot of these places, and not many houses around. And uh, we had jugs set out at every 50 yards. 
And then as the farther we got out, we had them set at 25 yards because the bullet drop will really kill you. And we were sitting out there and we saw some deers run at about 450 and, and uh, none of us took a shot. You know, we didn't want to wound one and then have to hunt it. And I didn't like to leave uh, Jack too far uh, behind out there. It's usually pretty cold. And uh, But the one thing that happened was there was a, there was a big uh, dog chasing, chasing these deer. And it ticked him off, and he he pulled up at 450 yards. He leaned. He still had his uh, his one foot. Then he was leaning on the on the back end of his pickup, and he says, "I says you got him. You got him. I got him. I got him." And sure enough, he put one right through the chest of that dog. Uh, 450 yards on a run, and uh, that guy, I, I I always was amazed at. Uh, you know, I had never seen a guy that uh, could really do something like that with a rifle. You know, but I remember looking through his scrapbooks and stuff like that when, when uh, he was a young kid. All the pictures of him either, <laughs> when he was little, he had a BB gun. Uh, he, every picture of him, he had a rifle or a pistol or something on him. You know, he, he really loved his uh, firearms. And then when I got into the gunsmith school, he, he kind of dug that. But he, he passed away. He was one of these guys with diabetes that just, he would drink uh, two or three bottles of uh, two liter size bottles of pop and eat Cheetos and chips and pop. And he would tell me, I'm going to live and do what I like till I die. I'm not going to live without this stuff. And yeah, he, he passed away from the diabetes. That was another place that, that I lived where diabetes was rampant just because of all the sweets and stuff, kind of like here. And I uh, lost a lot of friends to diabetes out there. But uh, my buddy Jack, he, he didn't matter. He didn't care that he had stumps. He loved to hunt just like I did and would go any chance he got. He missed coon hunting. He couldn't do coon hunting no more, but he loved the deer hunt. And uh, we went bear hunting a couple times uh, and, uh, and just loved it. I used to like to hunt with those guys. And uh, I was always one that would stalk. Uh, a lot of guys, when they go in the woods, they try to be quiet. Well, you know something, if you go in the woods, go in the woods like, like the animals do. A turkey makes all kinds of noise. Shuffle your feet, make a lot of noise. A squirrel makes a lot of noise and then stops. Uh, when I was when I was stalking up on deer, I would I would shuffle my feet from tree to tree and just not be silhouetted, and then stop, and then look, and I I would cruise right up on deer. I, I would cruise right up on deer with my bow, with the bow and arrow, and shoot them while they were still laying down. <laughs> you, know, you know, and uh, you can do that. You can you can sneak up on the animals, but you can't try and be quiet because. Uh, uh, being quiet, you know, turkey hunting. Turkeys make a hell of a noise when they're going through the woods. But uh, I turkey hunted one time, and uh, and what happened was, uh, was out coon hunting the night before, and I seen a bunch of them go up in the trees. They'll fly right up in the trees. And um, okay, so the next morning I thought, you know something? They, uh, I had seen them before. They they come out of these trees. They walk the side of the hill and then they walk down and they're looking for grubs and stuff. And then they'll turn around and come back up. So what I did is I got up on the upper side of the hill uh, with a, a long old long tong, 12 gauge shotgun I had. Beautiful, called them old long tong. It was a, just a beautiful Winchester. And uh, I sat down uh, in, a, in made a little ground blind and. Uh, I saw some turkeys come by, some hens come by first, and then uh, I saw a couple of jakes come by, and then here come Big Daddy. Big Daddy come by, he's dragging his beard on the ground, uh, nice nice big fat one, and he's strutting his stuff too, and when his head got behind the tree, I swung over on him, when he came out the other side, boom, took his head off at, at about, oh, it was only about 20 yards or so. And I uh, went and stood on him uh, while I was filling out my tag, and I took him home, and uh, cooked him. Had a lot of people tell me how to cook him. I went in and cooked him, and it was the most miserable uh, bird. Uh, it was it was absolutely terrible. And other people that cooked him, they were terrible. So from that day on, I never hunted another turkey out in the woods. I did all my hunting at the grocery store, and uh, I hunted that. There's a special breed in the grocery store. It's called a butterball. <laughs> That's the one I want. I remember they used to have commercials on uh, the TV about these skinny turkeys and saying, you know, they, these other ones were fresh. They weren't, they weren't all injected with stuff. Well, sorry, guys. You give me the one that's injected with all that stuff. <laughs> that's, that's the turkey I want. <laughs> but I never hunted them after that. Uh, people had them. Uh, everybody said, oh, well, you just have to cook it this way. Never had, never had good wild turkey. It just doesn't appeal to me. Uh, coons I would eat. A lot of triglycerides in them, but I'd cook them, uh, I would cook them 
uh, maybe once a year because they're just absolutely delicious. Bear meat's my absolute finest uh, meat. I love that stuff. Uh, but uh, when I was coon hunting, there used to be a fella, uh, old black fella, lived on the edge of town where I lived. And uh, he wanted all the coons I could get. I used to skin them and leave the meat out in the woods for the animals, but he, he wanted them. Uh, so I'd bring the coons home whole and skin them and then take the meat over to him and he just loved it he and he lived to be real old he was uh he was a real old timer he was, a lot of those old timers they didn't care about this cholesterol they didn't even worry about any of that stuff they ate what they ate uh they never ate margarine or oils or anything they cooked everything in animal fat they lived they lived to be old old as can be now this old fella he couldn't get out and go he had been a, a miner and he was actually bent over like a like an upside down L. That's how he walked, and his neck was all pulled up. He he was really bent over, and that's how he got around. He had his old stick, real short stick he used, uh, and he had his house all set up. He lived in a little kind of like a little shack on the edge of town. Uh, he was getting a real low Social Security uh, back then, and he was in his 90s, but he, he got around pretty good for being all crooked, and uh, we'd bring him food all the time, and uh, just, a, just a lovely old gentleman. Uh, I'd bring, sometimes he'd cook the coon, and I'd have a little bit. When I got the bear, I cold-packed a bunch of bear and brought it to him. Uh, he was happy as could be to get it. He, he loved that type of meat, and uh, if, if I hunted groundhogs, too, I used to hunt groundhogs quite a bit. But I, you know, a lot of guys would hunt them and stuff them in a hole. If I if I shot a groundhog, I'd go get them. But uh, I loved. I I had a um, I had a, a Ruger Super Red Hawk. I had a Nikon scope on it. Uh, I had the trigger all set up real nice. I had that thing. Uh, uh, barrel was polished really good. Uh, I had these uh, two. I would use the 240 Remingtons. Uh, just their stock bullet and that thing was just it, it would just punch one holes all day it was just the finest firearm and had this great trigger so when i would hunt groundhog i would stalk them i'd lay down on my belly and stalk them and uh and shoot them and get them and and you know because we ate them we'd cold pack them we'd eat the heck out of them damn things and uh i come out to the road one day and i had i had some groundhogs this game warden started to harass me what you doing out there with that big gun I'm standing there with two groundhogs hanging off my belt because you, you don't want to carry three. They're pretty heavy. And uh, I said, it's hunting. And even in, even in their game newspaper that they used to publish, when you buy a license, they were saying, use your high-power deer rifle to practice up on groundhog during the summer so you're a better shot in the winter. And this guy harassed me. You know, actually put his gun in his hand. And I had mine in my hand. I didn't have a holster for that. It was in my hand. And I said, uh, Mister, if you raise that gun towards me, I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> you know? And finally I said, you just get the hell away from me. Get out of here. You know? And I, and I, st I started retreating. And uh, he said, you better get back here. I know you. I don't give a shit who you are. I don't give a damn who you are. You don't You don't come and harass me like this. He had, he had no cause for it. He's seen my license. And then he gets all scary. But uh, game wardens, some of the game wardens were real jerks. That, that guy actually wound up getting shot. Uh, somebody, somebody shot him. Uh, nobody ever knows who. But uh, he was investigating somebody shooting an albino deer or something like that. And... Uh, uh, that you know that was a big thing in that area and uh, they riddled that guy with bullets from different directions so there was a lot of people who hated his guts and and uh, he went the way of the dinosaur and uh, then then all the rest of the game wardens in the, in that area they decided they better uh, cool down a little bit you know because you don't mess with a guy and his guy and his meat there was I knew a lot of people around there that like here they didn't have a lot of money and uh, they didn't get their license. If they if they needed something to eat, they they would go shoot a deer. And it's not like there was a whole bunch of them. It's just a few. And uh, you know, you you let them go. Uh, you know, let let them. They they need that to feed their family. They're not uh, they're not doing anything. When I had the, when I had the gun shop, there was a there was a young fella. He he had like seven kids and another one on the way. And he had a little skinny hillbilly girl. He was a little hillbilly dude, long bearded guy. Can't right now, bub. Can't right now. Get mom to put them on. Okay. And uh, he came in and ordered a rifle. You know, he wanted he wanted the uh, uh, 308, 
and uh, I had actions there in my gun shop and stuff. And he wanted he wanted a custom rifle. He said, I want, you know, I just I always wanted a custom custom made. Uh, and he he I had a whole list of things on a board of what you can order, and he ordered a bunch of stuff. And I knew him. I knew they were very poor, so I gave him like the lowest ball price. I pretty much did the thing for free. You know, I just did it for free. And uh, he gave me some money down, and I started uh, made it light. I had the Q QD uh, sling swivels that were were hidden. I put a nice leather because the nylon ones suck. Had a nice leather lightweight on there. Uh, I had some nice uh, Claro walnut that I did the stock on, custom fit them for it. And then uh, the scope, he wanted it uh, scout rifle style. And I even, uh, I had a, a gun that somebody traded in that had a really nice uh, Nikon uh, two power, uh, long eye relief. And so I went ahead and I put that on there. And then the barrel work, you know, the, there, there was $1,000 worth of barrel work in because I started out with a two inch and I built the mounts right into the barrel form. Plus the re a recoil lug at the, at the front of the barrel, not only also from the gun. And it was a Mark 10 action. And I had this thing all set up for him and charged him fifteen hundred. And believe me, uh, I didn't make I didn't make anything on that. But he came in with a tax check. Uh, they used to get this thing called a credit tax credit, even if you didn't pay into it. And that guy, you know, that was his cherished possession. He'll hand it down to his son, and you wouldn't believe every time I seen him, he had that thing taken care of. Uh, but one thing that used to happen, uh, I, I when I had the gun shop, I couldn't. Um, I couldn't really hunt during the gun season because the first day of uh, buck season, that's when you make your most money. And uh, it's always cleaning. And it was 35 bucks, guys. Sorry. That's what you, uh, that's what I charged. It was 35 bucks, and I could I could make, shoot, could I, I could make six, seven hundred bucks in the morning. You know what I mean? I'd have my boy working there. These guys would take their gun and slather them all up with oil. And, of course, they're keeping them in the house. And then... They'll go to the shooting range, take the gun out of the warm car, shoot it. Okay, it's shooting good, and they'll take it out. Well, then they'll get out at 4 o'clock in the morning when it's freezing cold, and their gun will gum all up. And they'll pop up, and they'll see that beautiful 12-point they always wanted to get. And they'll pull the trigger, and they'll go click, because that it, all the oil in there had jellified. So I would just clean them. You know, and I used to have a big sign up, you know, get your cleaning done now before the season. You know, you clean your gun before the season, and you dry it out. <laughs> you don't... And uh, mine, when I, when I was hunting, if I didn't get one to, uh, early, early on, uh, when I was able to hunt, I'd leave it out on the porch to stay cold. You know, you didn't want to bring it in and get it to sweat. You know what I mean? Uh, I'd leave it out on the, on the back porch or something like that. But a lot of guys don't do that, and I made a ton of money on just cleanings. So I, I wouldn't, a lot of times I couldn't go the first day because it was just too much money. And then I wound up getting a fella in the shop that... Uh, a uh, real good, real good guy. He worked for me for a few years, so so he'd be in there. And I, but I, I always liked to handgun hunt. I was uh, more of a handgun hunter than than I was, uh, you know. And even when I went to California, we had I had some buddies. We, we had busted uh, cap hunting club and hunting with the nines. <laughs> we always used to say, if you can if you can hit a running jackrabbit with a nine, you can hit a gangbanger. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll tell you what, I hunted with two guys. I hunted with a Filipino guy and then uh, Link, uh, my buddy Link. And I'm telling you what, those guys were absolutely uh, some of the most fantastic shots I've ever seen. And we did it with the pistols. Uh, one time, though, we were out hunting in the desert. And he, uh, my buddy Link had a 45. And uh, shooting, at, shooting at a jackrabbit in a big field. And that 45, we were using ball, that 45 came back and went right past me. Not not close, super close, but I could hear it zinging past, you know, had maybe 20 yards in front of me. And I stopped them and said, hey. So we rethought that and we started going with uh, 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 jacket, you know, not the full, but hollow points and stuff like that. So if you hit a rock, they deform. They're not going to ricochet back off a rock or something. But we had, we had a lot of fun hunting jackrabbits. Uh, just just a royal blast and i used to take different guns it was always fun to get a bunch of different guns i was never as good as those guys with the nine i could shoot at 100 yards and hit a brick uh with my beretta but those guys were constantly nailing nailing rabbits uh and then i also another one of my favorite firearms i had that i took up many times was the ruger uh old army black powder i used to use the um uh, pyrodex Fill the cylinder right up to the top, put the ball on, and squish it down. 
and uh, that was that was absolutely one of the that was a great firearm uh, I probably could have brought that here because it was black powder I don't know but I, I sure did love that sold it before I left though sold all my firearms before I left and that was a royal shame uh, would have loved to have him here but I heard of a fellow that was here he was a American guy and he had a bunch of guns and it was it was okay with them that they had him in the house and all this and then a new police uh, PMP guy took over that area and went straight over there and confiscated them all so you know I, I heard about that before I come so I, I just sold everything all my buddies got really good deals on some nice firearms and I had I had gun safes full of them so but that's that's something uh, you're gonna if you're a hunter you're gonna miss it here you're absolutely 100 percent gonna miss hunting and, and I surely do and uh, this is my my hunting vlog I hope you guys enjoyed it uh, I sure do appreciate all the comments I get from you folks and all the tips and advice and stuff uh, like I said before this channel started out as something for the kids and it morphed into uh, you guys are helping me more than you know uh, it's, it's actually a good therapy uh, you know because you, you know they just get tons of comments uh, just it's great I love the comments and uh, getting to know you guys I hope there's a lot of you when you come here we can meet go have a coffee or a beer or something like that and uh, that'd be really great uh, I know a lot of you are when this opens up you'll be coming along and uh, you know got you got your little Filipina and uh, you know you can make you can make a decent life here some people are saying oh I'm whining and bitching complaining I guess it's true the squeaky wheel gets the grease but I, I am just letting you know what what you're gonna run into now I don't know all areas we've been to uh, Mindoro when we were down in Mindoro uh, at her uncle's and and her uh, sister's place uh, there was never any problem with I never seen any problems with the dogs I never seen packs of them running around I never I never seen a problem with that and we walked all over the place uh, down there through the rice fields and stuff we actually took a really big hike to look at some land I was saying about some land down there and uh, you know it was a, a big chunk of land and we walked a long way you, you really couldn't drive it you know there was a road there but we had to go all the way out to the end of the road and all the way back around so we just walked it and it was a good it was a good mile or so uh, you know through the rice fields and the woods and all this stuff what you can call woods here and uh, so that and and Leyte I didn't see uh, you know that was uh, when I was in Leyte I went all the way down to the southern tip I spent a good bit of time there that was just a, a beautiful place uh, with the markets and everything um, so a lot of the things that that I report on is just from this local area I've been here eight years and it's pretty much I've been in Cavite uh, province the whole time and uh, you know trips to Manila and Laguna and stuff like that uh, and it just seems like this area that what I reported on is what you get you know uh, I'm just letting you know this is uh, for for a lot of you Filipinos you know some of the stuff in the house and all that yeah you can watch that and all this stuff but a lot of it's for uh, expats that want to come here so you're well informed uh, I did one here about uh, health care and all that stuff uh, if you're sickly uh, you know uh, Pokemon left me one he, he knows he's sick but he made the choice now so did I when I had my trouble uh, my big thing is the kids I'm, I'm trying to take as good care of myself as I can uh, I watch watch what I eat I stay away from the oils uh, you know I, I got a good uh, vitamin mineral supplement uh, doing the best I can and I made the choice to stay here because I think my kids are better off being raised here so you know that's that's my choice uh, now the thing I had uh, the worst my worst problem is the back uh, I still have this dang heart thing that could, I just it depends on what I eat I have to be real careful what I eat because every single time those doctors never knew what was wrong but every single time it started with the stomach ache I got a stomach ache or I couldn't go uh, you know get constipated from time to time and that's when the heart rate goes up and I had uh, the one time it was lucky I was in intensive care I went up to 195 and it stopped while I was there it, it stopped and that's when they got they hit me with some kind of medicine right away the doctor was hanging around he wasn't going home uh, that was a uh, real good doctor and he said you need you need to go you know you need to go and I, w I went to the states I got an emergency flight and went straight to the states so I uh, had had to get that taken care of probably could have done the same thing in India or whatever but uh, went to the states 
and uh, got her, got her taken care of. Uh, and and it's not gotten rid of it completely, but I've never had these real high ones. Uh, the highest one I had in the last year, I think, was about 135, and those ones aren't bad. When I when it starts getting up over 150, it's like you're demon possessed. And my legs get ice cold. I go into these shakes. I actually had a, a woman that you know was laying hands on me. Be gone, devil. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's serious, uh, and it, and it definitely was. I was demon possessed because it puts you into these terrible shakes, and and you can't do nothing, uh, can't stand up, uh, can't walk, you know. And uh, but the the fortunate thing about every time they happened, I knew they were coming because it started with the stomach ache. So if I was driving or anything like that, you know, I had plenty of time. I knew, uh, you know, it wasn't like they just onset me immediately. So, but uh, it was a choice I made to, to stay here. And, uh, you know, like I say, they're not, as, they're not as bad as they were with the procedure they did. And I'm glad they got that, that done. Uh, and I was online looking that up a whole bunch on a lot of people. And one woman said, you know, it just didn't work for her. And the people who have this condition I have, uh, nobody so far has said they know what causes it. And I, I truly believe it's the stomach. It's a stomach problem, putting pressure maybe on the vagus nerve, uh, you know, or something. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not really sure how that system works, but it always start. <coughs> excuse me, start out with stomach ache with me. So maybe it's because I'm not eating enough groundhog. <laughs> hey, you guys, take care. Uh, God bless everybody, and this is Rick Shaw. Out.